Hi there, you're listening to Unnatural Selection, the show about newsy type stuff and things. My name is George. My name is Adam. My name is Jack. <laughs> and with our vows combined, you we never are... let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> he was sneaking, got it real quick. Um, and with our powers combined, we are sort of Unnatural Selection. Make sure you visit us at our salubrious home on the web, Unnatural Show. Dot com. You may notice um, we don't have Tom on the podcast this week, but in lieu, we have a rule on the show. If we can have, we, we need to have at least one member of the Heath family at any given time. So Jack, best-selling author, Jack Heath has decided to step in in lieu of Tom uh, very graciously. So uh, welcome to the show again, Jack. Thank you for having me. And I can confirm for your listeners that salubrious is in fact a real word. I looked yes. it up. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's... um. It's real, um, it just not often. I don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah, well, it means um, warm and inviting, I believe, by uh, from recollection. All oh, so. right, nice. I just I've heard you say it, you know, a hundred, well, six hundred and forty-four times over the years, <laughs> and um, probably on around like the six hundred and fortieth, I called bullshit and went to the dictionary, and I'm like, no, that that is a legit word. <laughs> um, I feel uh, I feel proud that I um I I trounced a. Best-selling author. I mean, that's um, that's pretty good vocabulary-wise. I feel pretty proud of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, my my critics will tell you that my vocabulary is not the best. Mate, you should shoot shoot a little bit higher, George. I'm <laughs> sure you can best a better author than me. <laughs> I. By the way, I don't know if I've ever said this to you. If I was a best-selling author, I would introduce every. I would preface every sentence with. As a best-selling author, <laughs> I think you know, like on the commercials, where they go as a mother. Mm. That's how I would do every conversation I ever. People do, do you just add a bar like as a best-selling author? Could I get a whiskey on the rocks? Like, <laughs> you know what I. I used to have a uh, a blog, which thank goodness has was like deleted and lost to the sands of time. But I think um, back when I was writing the blog, I was not a best selling author, but I was an award winning author. But the award yeah. I'd won was not for writing, but I'd kind of leave that out. Wow. So <laughs> basically, the running gag was that whenever I was about to make an outrageous statement, I would always say, "As an award winning author, I'm qualified to know that," and then yeah. just say whatever stupid thing was on my mind. Well, we're we're an award seeking podcast from way back. So. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, right. Award if I ever end up in, in charge of a podcast award, I'll um I'll do my best to swing the vote your way. Thank you. Ne <laughs> Nepo babies here at Unnatural Selection for sure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, Jack, uh, you've got a, a new novel out um, called Kill Your Husbands, which I've read and is fantastic. Um, I'm always very intrigued by mm. people that we meet that, uh, that make a living making art. I find that very impressive. Um, so why don't you tell us, um, I just, that, that wasn't a question. It was just a statement. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> just, yeah, I find you very impressive. Um, <laughs> well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book, uh, and yeah, what what people, what, what you'd like people to know about it. Obviously I don't want to give anything away. Jack Heath books are filled with twists and turns as, as we know. So yeah, what, what would, what did you, what would you like people to know about it without giving anything away? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so Kill Your Husbands is a crime novel set in Australia. The gist of it is that you've got three couples who have been friends since high school and each of them has a marriage that's secretly in a little bit of trouble and for very different reasons. And they, uh, they rent a, um, a holiday house for a long weekend in a remote location, kind of digital detox, no phone reception type thing. You mm. can already see where this is going. And um, one night they have a little bit too much to drink. A game of truth or dare goes too far and they decide to try a partner swap. But the trouble is when the lights come back on, yeah, I just saw Adam's eyebrows go up. <laughs> George has read the book. I'm not sure Adam has. Um, so, uh, but when the lights come back on, one of the men is dead and no one can agree quite what happened and who his partner was and even which bedroom he was in. And because there's no phone reception, now the car key is missing. So they're kind of mm. stranded there and the killer's just getting started. So that's the basic premise right. of this. Okay. So, so I've noticed, so I've got a few questions. Mustard in the basement. <laughs> with, <laughs> Agatha uh, Christie, yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> I, it is very Cluedo-like. Yes. I, yeah. Okay. So I have a number of questions. Um, like, is it important as a, as a crime? Okay. So number one, Let's start again. Hello. Welcome to our natural Hello. selection. Um, yep. Our salubrious time on the web. Yeah. <laughs> so number one, when you come up with the, um, the outline of the story here, 
Do you do that classic crime novel thing where you sort of come up with the ending first and then sort of backtrack and find your way there? Or how, how does your sort of process work? And I'm not sure if I've asked you that before, but. Right, 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 right. Well, uh, every every book is a little bit different, um, which is probably why my job is so hard. Like every time when I'm halfway through writing a book, I I realize, I, I go like, I what am I even doing? It turns out I don't know how to write a book, but I eventually realize the problem is just that I don't know how to write this particular book and I, I need to kind of meet it on its own terms. But in this case, it kind of, it started out as an outline for a romance novel. Like oh, this Jack. is back in... <laughs> <laughs> a, ro- yeah, a romance this, this novel is in, this is not <laughs> well no not in the end <laughs> but um back in 2013 like 50 shades of gray was going gangbusters and i was like how do i get in on that action i mean like the book sales action yeah and not, so, not the wife swapping action yeah 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 but so i don't even know if there is actually a partner swap in 50 shades of gray i haven't there, read it, we know I, it's steamy there's lots of s and m sex yeah, that's what i've, I've gathered yeah, yeah, from to- memes on the internet (laughs) totally so i was trying to work out so i came up with this sort of partner swap romance novel idea where the idea was that there would be three couples and over the course of the partner swap like one couple would sort of rediscover their love for one another Mm. and but another couple would realize would make the swap permanent like basically Mm. they would realize they should have been with that other person all along Mm. um and then there was one woman who was going to end up single but better off and one guy who was going to turn out to be just like a dirtbag and get kicked out of the group so i had all these arcs Mm. mapped out but it but i'm not a romance writer is the thing and there was no so firstly writing a romance novel is hard secondly it's not actually what people come to me for like no one picks up a jackie book because they want a romance so this kind of just sat on the shelf for ages and then it was years later when I was like, wait, but if one of them was secretly planning to murder all the others, <laughs> then I got the tingles where I'm like, this could, that's the kind of book that I would want to read. Therefore, yes. I'm kind of interested in writing it. But your, your question was about, you know, knowing the ending first and stuff. Yes, mm. I, I always do, although the ending sometimes changes, but not in this case. In this case, I was like, okay, uh, I need six characters. Here's their names. I need six different occupations. Okay, so they can be a stand-up comedian. They can be like a finance bro. They can be a guy who owns a gym. They can be a, a woman who's unemployed, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, okay, I need six motives for murder because it doesn't, not just one, because like the reader, I've got to kind of keep them guessing. Mm. And then I need like six, again, like in clues, sort of six murder weapons. <laughs> and then I just kind of picked the most interest- interesting combination of like occupation, motive, murder weapon. Just and there, to see which character the rolls a D20 oh. successful murder. <laughs> Literally Cluedo. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, totally. Yeah, that's the super hard interesting. Hard. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that aspect of it because, of course, you have to like give every character a motive to keep the audience guessing, right? Because you can't have them like, well, unless you want to write, I mean, there are novels that are like that crime novels where it's like, you know, immediately the outset who did what. And then it's just a case of like the detective uncovering it and that's the tension, right? But yeah, so you, you need to sort of, have plausible motives for each one of the characters so it's not an immediate giveaway right that's, that's totally what and and when those decoy motives turn out to be decoy motives you don't want the reader to just feel like tricked or like their time mm. has been wasted so the discovery of each decoy motive has to lead the reader a little bit closer to the real killer as well mm. like so they don't feel like they're being led down a series of blind alleys this was even harder in this book than in any of my previous crime books because I wanted to have, you know, those um, those stories where it turns out the narrator did it. Like, I wanted to uh, yeah, write no, one of that. those, but take it like one step further, where you know the narrator did it from the beginning, but you don't know which narrator because there's like six mm. point of view characters. That's uh, that's the sort so, of stuff you can do with a novel. You just can't do with a film or a TV show, right? Like where you you the yeah. character, you the audience have access to the inner workings of a character's mind without necessarily knowing who the character is. Like, that's just something you couldn't pull off on, in a TV show, right? Because you have to see the yeah, person. Yeah, that's right. I, I was talking to um to some TV potential, like, TV producers about this specifically, and I was saying it, it's tricky because when you're in a novel, for the most part, the reader is inside the character's head looking out, mm. whereas in a um in a film and TV show, to oversimplify a bit, you're outside the character's head looking in and yes. kind of wondering what they're mm. thinking. So that was going to be really difficult. But... Uh, what I hadn't anticipated was that because these 
all the the killer was going to be a point of view character but the the reader wasn't supposed to know which one it was mm. that meant that i could never have any of the characters wonder who the killer was because as soon as they wondered that like the reader would immediately be able to rule them out and then via a process, right. of, process elimination, of elimination you'd work out who the killer is mm. so i'm yeah. like okay how how kind of disturbed and what other sort of awful things can I have going on in these people's lives and relationships that mean that while their friends are being picked off one by one, they're not even thinking about it. <laughs> or they're That's not really even interesting. I didn't, I, I have to say, I didn't it. pick up on that reading it like it, because, because there was always like as, as a set piece or an action piece where they were focused on oh, who did that thing. And if we figure out who yeah. did that thing, then we'll figure out who the killer is. Right. It was, you, I realized now that you say it, there was no extemporaneous kind of like wondering from internally each of the characters as to who the killer was because yeah you're right process of elimination you do you have three different chapters from three different perspectives if they're all going i wonder who the killer is you go well it's not those <laughs> it's not those three out of yeah, six that's right. like yeah i had to kind of um so each of them does speculate about who the killer is but they only do it out loud and only in a right. chapter from a different character's point of view so you're right. not sure if they're kind of like ah, jack, putting it on you know what jack I think you're pretty good at this. <laughs> you should be an author. <laughs> Thank you. You know, your encouragement goes a long way because, again, I'm like halfway through a book and it's going so badly. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so, Look, I, thank you I, very much. I know it's not the same thing, but as uh, so for my work, I'm a bid writer. So I write professional communications to try and get people to spend money, right? So yeah. here is a proposal for this thing. And there does, I, it's obviously not on the same like sort of, you know, writer's block level, but there does come a point when you work, cause you might work on these bids for a couple of weeks and it's like your major piece of work for a couple of weeks. And there does come a point during every bid where you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> do I even know how <laughs> yeah. to do this anymore? What is my life? What am I doing? <laughs> so I think, I think it kind of sounds a bit similar to what you're describing there. Yeah. I think mm. Jackie French, who's like a, a really great novelist, I've heard her say that that's how you know it's ready. Like the point at which <laughs> you, you are kill looking yourself. at the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like, I can't even stand the sight of this thing I've been working on anymore. That's when it's ready to, to show to someone else. <laughs> I am um, just back to what you were saying about, um, you know, you, you are a, that's what people expect of you, right? As you sort of gravitate more towards crime novels. I think yeah. like when we've done live shows in the past, right? Like we tend to sort of gear our stuff towards comedy, right? And so there'll be things mm -hmm. that we say during a live show when we've done those in the past where the audience will laugh. And I go, oh, I didn't even realize that was funny per se. I was just like talking and it comes filtered through that sort of comedic lens and people tend to find that funny. You forget that when you're doing a podcast because you don't have an audience, right? But then when you do it in front of people, yeah. people laugh and you go, oh yeah, I suppose that was funny. Um, is it the same thing? Because you're a crime writer, so everything goes through that crime sort of like lens. So it starts as a romance novel and ends up as a crime novel because you're Jack Heath. Like, is that how yeah, it works? Yeah, I, I guess so. There's, look, um, like I write for children as well, but can I assume that most of your li listeners are probably adults so I can be I, like a bit crude for I, a second? Legally, I hope that they are all adults because <laughs> this is not a PG-13 <laughs> podcast, I would like to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I, um, I, I apologize in advance to, to anyone who's got like kids listening, maybe to block their ears for a second, just in case you tuned in just to I, hear I me. I think they might have this... tuned out during the partner swapping bit. I think we, I think we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. But so I read a few years ago, this amazing, wonderful review of, you know, that, that Sylvester Stallone movie where he's a superhero. It's quite new. No one likes it. Um, the I forget what it's called. But oh, it was like on um, Amazon Prime. Yeah, or something. I saw it advertised. I was like, that looks like a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I I haven't actually seen it. So um, if, if it's really great, I apologize to the people involved in making it. But Samaritan. The, there's this, apparently, it's called. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay. So there's <laughs> this film. Thirty eight percent named... on Rotten Tomatoes. So <laughs> it's not <laughs> okay. on my to watch so, list. There's this film critic named Vince Mancini who wrote a great review of it where he like quoted some of the dialogue and then mm. was like, what even is this dialogue? Was the screenwriter being chased? It sounds like <laughs> the kind of thing that like porn actors say just to get through the plot in order to get to the fucking. Hey, and I so got a pizza deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, so, extra sausage. Followed, but then he followed it up with something really insightful. He's like, my question is though, which bit in this movie was supposed to be the fucking like what is 
what is it that they're trying to get to? And so when I'm writing a story, I often have that thought. I'm like, okay, which bit is the fucking? Like I'm not writing porn, but what is it? That the that the reader is actually going to mm. get out of it. Like you could make the same example about musicals, right? Like yes, in, in musicals, sort of the dot plot and dialogue is just an excuse to get to the songs. Yes. So if there were no songs or if the songs were crap, then you've written a crap musical. So yeah. in my case, I'm always going like, okay, what are the bits that the reader is really going to what? So sometimes it's about asking myself like, why am I even interested in telling this story, mm. and how mm. do I kind of get to those bits the most efficiently and um so in my case i feel like what i'm usually trying to get to what i'm most passionate about is those moments of realization the bits where the character realizes at the end of a chapter that they've like completely misunderstood what's going on like something that they that they thought was innocuous is actually a massive clue or whatever. Those bits are the fucking for me. Mm. So, guess, yeah, or, or, and they seem yeah. to be for my readers as or, well. Or put more eloquently, how do we get to the fucking? Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that. We'll, write, we'll write an essay on uh, on on that that methodology. Um, it's the name well, of my, my thesis. How, how do we get to, <laughs> how do we get to the fucking? To the uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, about, about narrative brevity by Jack Heath. Yeah, on, yeah. On well, let, let me give a little plug to Vince Mancini's okay. Substack, by the way, because mm. he has a great Substack of film criticism, and um, and he's full of little insights like that. <laughs> Vince Mancini. Mm. Yeah, yeah, out. that's the guy. Yeah. You had yeah. a question, Adam? I did. Uh, on that point, so obviously working out how to get to the uh, the the good bits, as it were. Do you? That's much like, more tasteful. Yeah, that's, that's very, you, very tasteful. Yeah, that's very NC seventeen way of describing that. Well done, Adam. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not always uh, polite, but when I am, nailed it. Uh, one question I had because, like, one thing I always found, like studying acting and that kind of thing, they always sort of, you know, they talk about sort of, you know, are you, are you using real or imagined circumstances, and like, how do you you get into the character's brain and and uh, and give a in the, in an actor's case a faithful performance, but in terms of writing, like, what do you you know if if you've set all these parameters up, so this character's a neurosurgeon and this character's a whatever, he's a military hard man. Like, how do you? write that or write their dialogue firstly but secondly how do you write things that they're talking about that sound either sound legit or are legit and that that actually makes sense for that character do, like if you don't if you don't know if you don't if you're not a neurosurgeon how do you know what medical procedures to how write how deep do you get instance? into the world yeah. of a gym owner yeah. in order to be able to write that character like how how do you yeah, get to that right. point yeah no i i know what you mean sometimes i think you can make a lot of so because this this book is about sort of three collapsing marriages, when I was writing it, I was like, okay, these characters are going to have to be thinking about other things other than who the killer is, especially in the first half when they don't even know that there is a killer. So mm. I'm like, again, how do I make this first half entertaining for the reader, even though no one dies yet, even though mm. they know that's coming? And so I started putting in all these details about the ways their marriages are falling apart. And then I pretty quickly realized I had a problem. I, I was talking to my wife and I was like, look, people are going to read this and think that this is us. And mm -hmm. some of it is like I've borrowed <laughs> from, you know, liberally from, yeah. from things that, that we've thought about over the years. Yeah, so, well, you're, you know, right? well, there was a passage yeah. about fatherhood. I think it was Owen. Was that the character's name? Owen? Uh, Oscar, Os I think. Oscar, yeah, sorry. Where he's talking about fatherhood and like the difficulties of a new father and going through that process. And I was like, I'm relating hard to this right now and it feels very real. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm really sorry to hear that, George. But yeah, he was. <laughs> it's fine. No, it's it's, all, it's my, fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to kill anyone. I, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that guy was by far the most autobiographical character for me, and it's funny because the the book was sort of structural edited by um someone who was contracted out from the publisher and who had never met me or and knew nothing about me, but she was a really mm. great structural editor. But she had highlighted this character and was like. At several occasions, I paused to marvel at what a truly unsympathetic character you've <laughs> created here. Honestly, I might have been taken in by him if not if I weren't privy to the constant whining and self pity of his inner monologue. Oh yeah, he and sucks. I was like, he sucks real bad. You can, <laughs> you can stop with the compliments now. <laughs> um, but yeah, you asked about sort of making the dialogue authentic and stuff, yeah. and the answer is I don't really know. I mean, a big part of it is just about sort of 
luckily my own job is has quite mm. a lot of variety in it so i can usually find bits of it and then sort of exaggerate so when when the guy who's a finance bro, his name is mm. Dom, and mm. he's talking about uh, making presentations to clients and how he likes to reframe his nervousness as excitement and blah, 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 blah. So some of that was just things that I've heard, you know, finance bros talk about on, yeah, on okay. you know, the, I watch the same like, TikTok as like anybody YouTube, else. Just get YouTube some Grant Cardone of, going just, on the YouTubes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but actually a really good example. So one character there's that guy who's the finance bro there's felicity um his wife who is a stand-up comic and in both cases i was able to draw for my own experience because i stand up in front of rooms full of kids and like try to to make entertaining presentations about my books and about my life so in both cases i can kind of just do a sort of twist on my own experiences and my own life to lend a bit of authenticity to something that i've never experienced so um yeah. but yeah, yeah, but also it takes a million drafts. Samaritan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so but it also it takes a million drafts to get it right. You know, those, yeah. those first drafts are very clunky and inauthentic seeming, and then I show them to a bunch of people, and they all make little suggestions, and then eventually mm. you've got something that the reader might might feel convinced by. I, uh, thank you. I, um, I get the impression you think about crime a lot because there's times when characters, like I'm reading your, uh, just finishing your other one in this series, uh, Kill Your Brother. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's points where the character thinks, you know, um, you know, I might, you know, I'll do this. No, I can't do that because she'll think this. You know, there's a little bit of game, sort of game theory happening there as to like what's yeah, going okay. or what or what the cops all know or what what people will will think of. Um, that sort of your characters having, having theory of mind for other characters um, and it gives me the impression that you think about crime a lot or you watch a lot of crime dramas or like Netflix crime documentaries because because it feels like stepping back, if I think about it, it's like you as the writer are like trying to game out, okay, well, what would the character think in this scenario? Like what would, how would they get out of this situation or what would they do? Is that is that the case? Am I reading that correctly or? Yeah, well, um, yes and no. I mean, the reason that writing takes sort of so much concentration like mm. so uh, which means things like if i haven't had a good night's sleep i can't do it i just like mm -hmm. stare, stare at the screen and you're right it's because you're not just thinking about what should happen you're like okay what will the reader think based on what the character thinks about what a different character thinks and mm. that's like enough levels of abstraction that you need mm. to kind of not be distracted and be firing on all cylinders to do it which i'm not most of the time but mm -hmm. i don't watch any true crime documentaries i am however constantly committing crimes in my head <laughs> okay. like, i'm glad you clarified really... in my head because otherwise <laughs> yeah. this would be a very different sort of interview <laughs> No, for for the record, I'm like law abiding, possibly to a fault. Like I don't even. Ladies and gentlemen, and we other... got him. <laughs> Shut it down. <laughs> Rub, this whole thirteen years of this podcast has been a very long con to get Jackie to admit that he's a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm the kind of person where, like, you know how sometimes at the lights in the middle of the night, like you're a pedestrian, so you hit the button. There's no cars around. Actually, this might be a Canberra thing. So there's like nothing happening. It's dead. The end of the world could have happened. I still wait for the little little man to flash green before uh, I cross the road. It's like, such I'm a good book. Cool cool I, I know what you mean, Jack. I'm from Hobart, so I, I completely get yeah, it. Yeah, Everything yeah, shuts down after six o'clock. It's dead on a Sunday. Goodbye. <laughs> there's no one in this city. You could shoot a zombie yeah. film here and, and there wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be a peak of boo. Yeah. That doesn't make any Adelaide sense. Adelaide too. Yeah. I, was, I was on tour in Adelaide once and i like flew in on a sunday evening and went looking for somewhere to get dinner and the only place i could find that was open was a mini golf play <laughs> uh, everything else is shut but so <laughs> the point is though i do love thinking about it like uh my friends and i used to play a game where we'd go like okay if you were wanted by the police for a crime you didn't commit how would you get out of the country <laughs> like that kind of thing we'd just make and they're these like so this is a wendy's <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I don't know. Everywhere, so all those thoughts have to have somewhere to go, right? Otherwise, they. I mean, I'd have to become a real criminal. <laughs> but instead, I'm able do, to kind of put it down on the page. Do you think and, you'd be a good um, criminal based on having gamed out some of these uh, scenarios in great detail <laughs> for millions of I, audience members? <laughs> I really don't think I would. I mean, I'm I'm bad enough at like regular 
life. And presumably, so if you take the level of difficulty that regular life requires and then add on <laughs> the difficulty of like trying to get away with something illegal at the same time uh i i don't think i could do it i would like immediately accidentally confess to a police officer i happened to walk past on the street <laughs> when i only intended to say good morning to you sir um i i'd like mm. to think that i would have been a great criminal prior to like 2001 you know what I mean? Where oh, I was like, yeah. until it like, you know, mobile phones and cell towers and GPS. And I was just like, CCTV. Like, I feel like it's too hard to get away with crimes now. I feel like, like 1987, I would have been a great criminal. But yeah, modern right. day, I just, I just don't know how much you can actually get away with anymore. Like, oh, yeah, the I good mean, old days. The good old days. <laughs> are, you, are you leading us to, is that a nice segue into talking about Trump? Because I feel like he's kind of modern day criminals. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we can go there so with everything, every single time, always. That's a good point. Yeah, I suppose you get to a certain level of fame is where if you do your crimes in public, then it's what people like you for. So, <laughs> yeah, you can write a book about yeah. all the crimes you committed, and for some reason, it's fine. Yeah. Or rather, you can have a ghostwriter write a book about all what the was crimes the, um... you committed. Was it um? What was the American footballer again? Um, ah, uh, you mean OJ Simpson? With the glove. OJ Simpson. He wrote the book, and it was if I did it. Or if I did it, like what a piece of shit! <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, there was a, a Chris Rock Saturday Night Live sketch yeah. that like preempted that. Like he was oh, really? talking. He he was showing off all these books, and he hi he had as a joke like a book by O.J. Simpson called I Didn't Do It, But If I Did Do It, Here's How It Went Down. And then O.J. Simpson literally wrote the book. Yeah, oh wow. That's, man, O.J. Simpson sucks. Um, <laughs> okay, so, well, on that note, um, interview section of the podcast is done. No more book talk. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, it, yeah. finish. Kill your husband's available at all good bookstores and some bad ones. Let's Thank talk you. about some really, really bad people. Um, and your website, Jack, oh. is... Oh yeah, jackethrider.com. I'm on mm. at jackethrider on all social media, but I've I've decided to take a year off from the socials, so okay, I, I did, might still Okay. Post. I, your Honor, may I apply may I approach the bench? I wish to reopen the interview portion of the show. So <laughs> just quickly, I saw you had <laughs> you yes, you were very vocal during the voice referendum stuff, and I imagine that's what sort of preceded you wanting to take a bit of a break on Social media? Am I interpreting that correctly? Or yeah, yeah, kind of, it, it was one of many factors, but yeah, I this must be difficult because I feel like a lot of what you're doing, as well as the writing of the books, is the promotion of the books. Hence, like you know, being doing things like this, being on podcasts and and social media and things like that. How do you kind of balance those things with like because you are obviously like a public persona now, you have a following. Do you know? Do you feel the yeah. need to sort of weigh in on those things? Like, well, it sounds like uh, the question is, how do you balance it? And I suppose the response is like, I'm not on social media anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the The answer to that question is not very well <laughs> most of the time. I think it's tricky because so there's pressure from the publishers to be on social media. That's what I imagine, that's, right? Yeah, for them, it's free, <laughs> and but also, I mean. So social media is where a lot of people spend a lot of their time. Therefore, it's a it's an important kind of um, marketing thing to be on. Although there's this other funny paradox where like the more time you spend on social media, probably the less time you have available to read books. So mm. I'm, I'm not sure how book talk even became a thing, really. But um, there's also a thing where the publishers get on social media and try to plug the books, but um, but readers and people watching it don't care. They only care to hear the author themselves talking about their their work or their lives or whatever. So or, or someone reviewing my, um, it or whatever. Like yeah, yeah it's, it's, that's, exactly. it's not content. If someone's like this new book coming out on July first, like people will be like, okay, like why are you in my feed? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some people, they're even like, you know, why are you spamming my feed? And I'm like, dude, do you get the feeling it's, it's that I made this video specifically <laughs> for you? Yeah, yeah, possibly. <laughs> like, yeah, it's weird. But so usually, though, I try to stay out of politics, like not in my in my life. I, I have my own opinions. I share them with my friends and stuff. But as a, as a general rule, um, there's areas 
most areas that I have like no expertise in. So um, doesn't stop I, us. I kind of <laughs> well. I don't know. You guys at least have journalism degrees, right? Well, so Tom, I, Tom does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, so Tom does. <laughs> we got, we got one journalism degree and we pass it around each episode. So that's sad. That <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. But uh, either way, the, the danger of like spending too much time on social media, though, um, uh, some of it's the obvious time suck thing. Mm. Like if you're on it a lot, you don't have time to write books. But there's also it kind of changes your worldview a little bit. Like you start looking at the world through a lens of things to post about rather mm. than things that might make a good scene or a good story or an interesting character or something like that. And presumably and it's then- the opposite of the kind of like deep work that you were describing earlier in terms of like putting yourself in the mind of another character, thinking about other people's theory of mind, right? Like that's very deep yeah. work, whereas like writing tweets is the opposite of that, right? Exactly. So the, the more I'm on social media, the harder I find to to write the books. And the voice to parliament thing, I felt compelled to weigh in on that kind of for two reasons. One, it was a referendum. So like we were all kind of forced to have an opinion on that. Sure. So I figure, and I could see people saying things about it that I knew for a fact were not true. So I was- um, we, we, we documented was like, them extensively on the show, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So I made kind of one angry video and that kind of spiraled into like it becoming sort of almost my full-time job for about a month, like dealing with- But the reason I had to get off it was not so much the trolls as the fans. I think it's like mm. the the trolling, I'm like, well, it feels kind of good to be hated on by someone who is so clearly an awful person or a liar that, or does it? whatever. It always like, hurts my feelings. <laughs> I don't know. I, I felt like I could give myself a pat on the back. I'm like, if such awful people hate me, then I must be great. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> one way to look like at it. like a big yeah. head. But, but it's also like... um the people kind of messaging me to talk about how much they like my books or how much they like me or whatever, there's a very sort of, there's a dangerously addictive quality to that as well. Mm. Like, I don't think it's actually healthy to be put on a pedestal. And again, you kind of ended up, I was writing my books, imagining what all these people would think of the books, which was kind of brain space being siphoned away to what Mm. the fans would think as whereas i i really needed to be thinking about just the characters so the reason i decided to take a year off was basically because i don't have a book for adults coming out this year i've only got Mm. books for kids coming out my next adult book is in 2025 so i'm like great kids aren't supposed to be on social media anyway although i'm aware that meta Mm -hmm. is currently facing a class action lawsuit for not doing enough to keep them off the platform so i may as well just my social media marketing side of my business is kind of going to be wasted for 2024. Mm. So why don't I just unplug completely? Having said that, I'm still posting, but I'm doing it using like Canva. So it Mm -hmm. posts things to social media so Mm. I can say, my new book is out, but I don't Mm. see any of the comments or the messages. Canva's great. Presumably. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, I, I assume it, I mean, my Facebook mm. profile is covered with people saying, you said you'd be off social media for a year, sure. but I don't know. But you don't I see him because you're off social media. Yeah, we, we use yeah, a, exactly. a program called Buffer where it's like basically a, like a social media queuing thing. So I'll put together a post at the end of every show and then a post goes out to Instagram, post goes out to Facebook, post goes out to Twitter based on yeah. whatever I've put together for that episode. And it's like, I'm not good at social media I don't like using it. I don't like seeing it. I don't like like interacting with people, but I'm also aware that it's like, if we want people to find the show and listen to it and enjoy it, like they need a link to click on somewhere. So yeah, right. Yeah. I've never like, there are friends of ours, like Susie, who's like great at social media. It's it's like, you know, it's her job. She's also like, you know, part-time sort of influencer type person as well. It's like, and she just like kills it. She's like constantly making mm. videos and TikToks and Instagram reels. And it's just like, honestly, bro, I would find that fucking exhausting. Like I would mm. yeah, try right. that just say it seems like so I like doing the thing, which yeah. is getting on and doing the podcast and having conversations. But like the promotion of the thing, it's just like I could actually well, not give a fuck about that. that that's what people right. have, you know, they have full-time marketing assistants because it yeah. is literally a whole nother job to your point, yeah. Jack. Yeah. It, it is it is a whole nother it, it, it is a its, it's own a section job. of the brain yeah. that you need to do to have um yeah. to, there's a to, reason you know, that we've been know. doing this podcast for 13 years without and any no listeners, listeners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i i think it's 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 also becomes a sort of self-sustaining thing at a given mm. point though like yeah. my goal is to get to the point where there are oh i feel disgusting saying this 
Um, lucky you don't have any listeners, as you just said. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's just between you <laughs> so, and me, yeah. Zach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But between me and you two and possibly my brother when he listens, my goal <laughs> is to get to the point where enough people are talking about me on social media that I no longer have to talk about myself on social media. Like the the content is made by other people mm. um, who are interested in discussing my books and I don't have to be involved with it in any way. You're, just, you're basically saying that you've got to become a meme icon. You want, become <laughs> you, 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 want, you want to become Joe Rogan. You want Jack, Jack Heath <laughs> meme clips account and they take what you say. You just talk about smoking DMT a lot and then someone on the internet will get on and start <laughs> chopping it up and put like, you know, an Alan Watts you know, piece of music mm. over the top of it. Like, it'll be Yeah, fun. I don't know what any of those things you just said are. Oh, I don't know what DMT is. I don't know what Alan Watts is. You're I'm, fine. I'm don't worry about half it. Aware of, You're better yeah, off not okay, knowing. Great. Other people can, can meme me, right? Yep. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you have my permission to meme me. You're doing me oh, a favor. Oh, God. <laughs> is, is, well, first of all, that was a very dangerous thing you just said. <laughs> Second of all, I love the difference between – millennials and elder millennials <laughs> they're just like feel free to meme me i'm like oh god jack no no what are you doing no jack please wait wait hang on let me do like a funny face so people can put a speech no. bubble next to me no don't do it <laughs> and, that, and that's how people started thinking that jack heath was a white nationalist um oh, no. <laughs> that's how they get you I, I see what happened yep 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 i, yep. I made it bad but- you know, is is you know all content, good or bad, still good because it mm. uh, it spreads the the uh, the name mm. and the algorithm uh, yeah. picks well, it up and spreads like wildfire. Yeah, yeah. The the people like the people hating on me after the voice to parliament like raised my profile an enormous yeah. amount. I I can't be sure that it <laughs> sold books, yeah. but. That's yeah, the fucked up thing know. about it. It's like it's a real reversal of the incentives, right? Because it's, you think about, okay, well, I'm getting lots of engagement, but does engagement actually necessarily mean anything? Does it translate to more followers and translate to more sales? Or am I just like, you know, you're just like pissing people off out there yeah. somewhere in the ether and everyone's getting real mad about it and that's why there's lots of engagement? Like, does that turn into fans? I don't know. Like, Yeah, and kind of even if it does, I feel like, like it's is that the way slimy. to get them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, if you ask... um. You know, uh, Andrew Tate, then the answer would be yes. Okay. Oh, don't get me fucking started on that guy. Okay. Yeah, We're slamming okay. the interview portion of the show. Shut. Bang. Shut. Bang. Straight news reportage now. Reportage. Uh, so. Speaking of uh, bad, bad people. Yeah. There we go. So Donald Trump has won the Iowa caucuses um, in, a, in a not upset. What's the opposite of an upset? A set? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in a completely predictable set of events. Donald yeah. Trump has won the Iowa GOP presidential election caucuses um, uh, with uh, uh, around 51% of the vote. So there's two different reads on this at the moment based on the commentary I'm hearing. People saying like, yep, Donald Trump, you know, didn't give a single fuck and still swept the Iowa caucuses like pretty easily. Like this shows that he's going to win the nomination handily. And then there's another part of the conversation which is sort of saying, okay, but yes, he's coming in as what should be an incumbent right? Someone who's had a term of, of the presidency previously. And if you're an incumbent president coming to the Iowa caucuses and you only got 51%, like that would actually be a pretty weak showing. Yeah. So it's weird because he kind of like gets all the benefits of being an outsider because he's had a term of outside of the presidency and all the benefits of an incumbency, but without any of the expectations, which is a little bit oh, yeah. weird. I mean, there, there are expectations. Uh, <laughs> but to win but, with 51% of the vote yeah. is not like a thumping. It's not overwhelming, right? Like clearly the majority no. of the GOP is behind him, but not all of it. Now, Ron DeSantis came in at 21%, Nikki Haley at 19%. Ron DeSantis is like a, kind of a Trump without the baggage, right? That was his selling line. So I, how many mm. of those voters would just revert back to Trump if DeSantis wasn't in the race? Probably most of them, I think. So yeah. you're only looking at oh. Nikki Haley being able to coalesce maybe 20, 30% of the party around mm. a non-Trump kind of candidacy, a factional candidate. That's what the New York Times mm. called her. So well, you've got Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy who's, well, he had 7.7%. He um, dropped out uh, uh, he dropped after the out. Iowa caucuses, yeah. but, but he was basically like, MAGA number one, peace. And then, um, <laughs> so I think clearly he wants to be vice president or something like that. He spent the yeah, whole so campaign sucking up to Trump, basically. So Yeah, it and he's, he's on the day, right? So, oh, the, the weather was, was terrible. It was like in the low, yeah, so um, did, in the low the 30s or 40s. Was low as well? It was, yeah. It was something like 110,000, which is like historically, 
I think the lowest since 2012 mm. or something like that, 2016 maybe. So mm. it's not Should been uh, described as well that like for people who may not be familiar with American politics, that yeah. the Iowa caucus is basically the Republicans getting together and deciding who their presidential uh, yeah. So each party going to be. yeah. For those who don't know, that's a good point. So each party, the Democrats and the Republicans, will go through a process where they go through each one of the states and vote. The caucuses mm. are a little bit weird. They have weird rules. But like a regular primary is just like a straight up election. Which candidate do you want to be your candidate for president? And then at the end of that process, you have a candidate and then the two candidates from each party go up against each other. So Joe Biden is the presumed candidate for the Democrats unless he keels over and dies. There's a non-zero chance of that at his advanced age. Uh, and Donald also Trump. Trump. Yeah, well, he's only like, like three he, years younger. He also may keel over and die. Oh, and like <laughs> side, side, sidebar also has 91 pending criminal charges against him and has been struck off <laughs> oh, the yeah. ballot in Maine and what was it? Colorado, I think. Colorado. So like and that's the other interesting part of it is that yeah, yeah I mean And fifty one percent of people still went, that seems like a great idea. <laughs> good good idea. Um fifty six uh, 1,260 votes uh, in this in this Iowa caucus. Now, the Iowa caucus is the first caucus, and there are several other ones, and some of them are combined. They're like, Super Tuesday! Yeah. And it's like, they get them all, they get a bunch of states together, basically, and they do a big one in one hit. But what's inter what I'm not sure about here is the timeline. So he's, he's currently been struck off the register in Colorado, Maine as well, although in Maine- We're court, talking about the general uh, election, though. That's not the primaries. So you can no, still correct. have a, a Colorado primary and pick uh, up- Delegates, but but this right. is the thing. What what I'm confused about is that like he could, yeah, he could get to whichever caucus they're involved in, whether it be a, a conglomerate one or an individual one in Colorado mm. or Maine, and he could presumably be elected the nominee where he is not allowed no, to be. Yeah, exactly. The that nominee. is absolutely a thing that can happen um, in America for some reason. And and the the thing is like the, so. There's a, a federal a Supreme Court. Um, you know, a uh, challenge that they're trying to overturn that and it probably will well, yes. probably pass. So so uh, it's been ruled on by the federal mm. courts. In, well, the, sorry, the I think it's the Supreme Court in each state, the yes. Colorado and Maine, and then presumably is a challenge that's going to be escalated up to the Supreme Court. And I think it will get taken up by the Supreme Court because you need has, a national has, decision on this yeah. one way or the other. You can't just have certain states where- so, so Colorado yeah, is It's currently with- It's color, currently with- the Supreme Court in terms of the Colorado thing. Yeah. Maine, there is a more of a local court. I'm not sure which level in Maine, but that the they've already level, said they've already said they've sent it back to the Secretary of State or whatever the, the role is in Maine to have it re-looked at. Hmm. But as to how long all this takes to work out as we go through the caucus process, I, I don't know. Like we're getting I mean we've got what? Like it's a November election, so eleven months for yeah, all the, this. The sort primaries of are gonna like well, the thing is, the primaries, the way primaries work is you pick up delegates at, at, each, uh, at each round, right? So round one, the Iowa caucus, round two is New Hampshire primary, round three, South Carolina, and then you go into various other states. Like you say, Super Tuesday, that's a big one. By Super Tuesday, you're pretty much locked in a candidate, right? Because the math becomes such that, especially in states where it's winner take all, like you might, mm. so say for example, I think Florida is winner take all. If you get 51% of the vote in Florida, you get all of the delegates from Florida. So it comes a certain point by Super Tuesday where it's like the math just becomes impossible for other candidates to pick up the amount of seats required mm. to win. So it's like, if you've got a candidate mm. with 250 seats, Trump, and you've got Haley with like 50 seats, it's like, well, there's no way that she can ever possibly get to whatever it is, 270 that she needs to get mm. to in order to win. So, like, the, that person it's, ends up being the de facto candidate pretty early yeah. in the process, I would say, and that's why the momentum from these early states is so important. They talk about momentum, electoral momentum. If DeSantis can, you know, invested really heavily in Iowa and if he can win in Iowa, then he'll get momentum, quote unquote, and the momentum will take him into New Hampshire and people will decide they like him there all of a sudden. I don't think that's really how it works, but- DeSantis outspent know. Trump in this. Oh yeah, uh, like multiple. Well. But because he had to in order to like make a dent, and he spent ages in Iowa. Like he skipped over New Hampshire because he knows everyone fucking hates him there. And he's gone straight to South Carolina. He talked about this weird speech. Was saying he got a, I got we got our ticket punched to keep going, and everyone's like, bro, just. Like, stop, stop, he's already dead. <laughs> like, it's like someone made a joke about uh, the sixth sense that he was dead the whole time. <laughs> like, he was, he was never a live, viable candidate. Like, this guy is an absolute goon. Go like, if you looked at the polls a year ago, 
he, he was beating Trump in the Iowa caucuses. When it, when push comes to shove and people actually need to choose between them, he's such a gormless, charmless goober that people are like, well, why why have Diet Coke when I could just have the real thing? You know, like, doesn't yeah, make any sense. I, I think maybe one of the scariest things about this is that when when Trump sort of first ran for for president oh not what he first ran i know he kind of pretended to run like several times over the course of a couple of decades yeah he, he, he <laughs> um, had a couple then, of failed runs prior yeah 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 and also um only ran as a publicity stunt and never intended to win if you believe fire and fury <laughs> yes yeah that, that was that <laughs> was the impression i got in, really horrified <laughs> when i was watching in 2012 it didn't feel like a real candidacy you know what i mean it felt like he wanted to like spruik his stakes or something like that was the vibe yeah yeah it, Exactly. But so the thing is, he like he used a lot of kind of, you know, uh, like dog whistles and stuff in his um, in his stump speeches that first Mm. time around. But this time he's I I don't know if it's, you know, he's gotten bold or he's getting dementia or what, but he's like using openly fascist language. There was something he said in his sort of victory speech in Iowa about how um, poisoning the blood of the nation. Yeah, that's literally the the a quote from Hitler. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, this is real sort of Hitler stuff. And the thing is, whether he wins or doesn't, the fact that there's so many and I mean wins the nation or doesn't, wins the presidency or doesn't, mm. the the fact that he has so much support, who if you can't put that cat back in the bag, like mm. he's Ron DeSantis, like you said, is just basically Trump again, although he would argue that he's a more competent. Trump, but Trump, Trump a more confident lifts. Trump is like still an evil person. Trump, yeah. Trump and heels. So, yeah, I heard, I think it was Jason Pargin who said that like, if America is a clown car going off a cliff, Trump isn't the driver, he's the hood ornament. And I think that's exactly <laughs> right. Like, I like that. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I he's think the mascot the for fact, fascism. Yeah. The fact that you've got an incredibly popular fascist candidate is really bad news for the United States. However, the oh, it's rest bad. of this year goes Jack, down. Jack Heath yeah. coming in with the hot takes. Fascism is bad. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, is it not revolutionary to to state that like American democracy is in maybe the most oh, dangerous I'm... position it's ever been? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I thought you said you weren't an expert. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. My bad. I know nothing. I'm, I'll go back to being Gareth Reynolds. What? <laughs> Tell me stuff, boys. What? That's crazy. Why? Why is everyone so excited about hats? Um. <laughs> so yeah, it's bad. Um. I I've I've got a like this weird little. I don't know, maybe it's just because I've got like a preternaturally kind of like pessimistic worldview. But I really do think that we're staring down the barrel of another Trump presidency. Like I think there is a very non-zero chance that Donald Trump will become president again. And at, at that at that point. I might just need to throw my television out the window. Like, I just can't do another four years of Trump material. Like, mm. we've done it. It's done. We'll just focus on, like, yeah. New Zealand politics or something. We'll just get out of the, we'll just get out of the region entirely and just focus on Jacinta Ardern's, like, I don't know. She's not even in politics business, anymore. She's, she's, not, she's anymore. making honey, <laughs> selling farm-to-table artisanal honey with Jacinta Ardern. That's, that's what the focus yeah. of the podcast will be. Or maybe we'll just take a year break from social media. Like we'll do it. A a year long, a four year long break. (laughs) break. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, though, this is like relevant to us because since AUKUS, like we are so closely tied Mm. to the United States. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that, Jack. (laughs) <laughs> yeah oh okay are we, are we segueing nicely into another well, terrifying we story yeah we can yeah so i mean this is not really news yeah. as such as it's uh i mean it was probably sort of you know predictable um michael west uh media is an independent uh journalist and love sort of michael west he does a team, great team around him um at the moment um he put an article out uh, earlier in January. Some of these articles, by the way, are, are a little bit older because uh, we have been we've had our longest break ever here at Unnatural Selection. We had mm. four weeks off, and that 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 felt weird to me. But anyway, um, so this is from January second. But uh, Michael West has made the point that Australia, through the AUKUS, um, the AUKUS deal, has effectively given or you know. Uh, reneged on its uh, commitments as a member of the non-nuclear proliferation uh, treaty. Australia um, has. 
Australia has, correct. Yeah. Now, the reason for that is part of the AUKUS agreement is that Australia is going to be giving money to the US to help fund their submarine uh, industrial base. So basically, the US is trying to ramp up submarine production. They're trying to also phase in a new type of submarine. So they're currently making Virginia class. They want to make a new one called the Columbia class. Uh, these ones are all you know, submarines that can shoot missiles. And I don't ever want to hear again hundred... how we don't have money for social housing when we are giving the Americans $4.7 billion to improve their manufacturing base yeah. in a different country so we can get <laughs> our submarines on time. Like, I don't ever want to hear again about Labor turning out its pockets going, oh, sorry, there's no money for homelessness. Oh, the Greens are going to fuck us up if we don't. Okay, here's a couple of billion. I never I never want to hear it again. There's no money. Where's the money in the budget for, like, Anthony Albanese, I guess, just slipped, wrote on a piece of paper and then slipped it across the table to Joe Biden and goes, is this okay, daddy? Can we send you this much? And, and then Joe Biden goes, yeah, okay, corn pop, that's all right. Like, we just... We haven't got money for shit at home, but there's always money. There's always money in the banana stand for submarines for improving the manufacturing base in a different country. The US, you famously you, poor you United you, States of America. This is George Sipos coming out against foreign aid, people. You, you <laughs> heard it here first. That's what I heard. <laughs> um, but of course, yeah. So oh. basically, Michael West Media has made the, I guess, the the claim, um, and I guess that's probably fair enough, that, you know, some of this, and, and it's, it's based on a report from the US, uh, what is it, the US Congress? Um, well, if, if we are a, giving a, them a, money a, and they are making- service report confirms that the money will be used for these submarines. If they're making nuclear, are, not just nuclear, nuclear powered, uh, nuclear armed nuclear submarines. Armed like submarines, like that is yeah. the definition. If you had to describe what proliferation is, it is helping someone get more nukes out there, right? Like that is what yeah. nuclear pro proliferation is. And that's always and been up place, until about December last year. Labor's stated policy platform is that they weren't going to assist with nuclear proliferation. Like some people believed you and took you at your word when you were campaigning on these issues, that that wasn't going to happen. But, you know, military industrial complex is going to military industrial complex. So, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Jack, you go. I was going to say, I did some like back of the envelope calculations because I'm like an incredibly morbid person. And I was like, okay, so it says, according to Michael West Media, we are giving the US money to build this many missiles which can be loaded each with this many warheads um, which can get out to... So if they stick to the terms of treaties where you can actually load like 12 warheads onto one of these missiles, but... Yeah. Capacity-wise, um, yeah, but you're only allowed to... Yeah. You're only allowed to load eight. As though yeah, that's going to stop nuclear war and go, bah, we only got eight, <laughs> so... You can only trigger eight nuclear apocalypses per missile, even though they have room for more. As, as though you can <laughs> just have yeah, more missiles? They can actually attack... Each boat can attack 128 cities. That's yeah, because each one of those missiles and, has eight separate things and they can yeah. all be separately targeted, yeah. Indeed. Now, there are 33 cities in the world that have more than 10 million people in them. So... That's already giving us, like, the, with the amount of money we've just given the USA, we could kill hundreds of millions of people. Like, I was just sitting there going, so this isn't, like you were saying, George, when instead of, like, funding social housing or something like that, or just what anything. if we make it possible? Even car parks. Just Even corrupt fucking car parks would be better than this. At least corrupt yeah. car parks <laughs> aren't going to bomb Yemen. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's, it's disastrous. And the, the thing is that, like, so nuclear, I remember someone saying like, uh, oh, we we shouldn't be worried about nuclear war. We should be worried about climate change while someone else is arguing, oh, we shouldn't be worried about climate change. We should be worrying about nuclear war. And I'm like, guys, this stuff is not mutually exclusive. Guys, we can it's worry about it all. And where... I do constantly at 3 a.m. in the morning yeah. when I'm trying to get to sleep. <laughs> and in fact, one makes the other more likely. Like, mm. so climate change causes less and less of the planet is habitable, which causes more fights over territory and resources, which makes mm. nuclear war more likely to happen. Also, nuclear war makes parts of the planet's uninhabitable which puts the same strain on resources so yeah world's gone to hell in a handbasket and we are paying for it that's the bit that makes me so mm. mad like uh, my taxes are killing us <laughs> 
it's so bad. It's, uh, yeah, and it's it's one of those things where because it's we're giving money to certain parts of the industri- U.S. industrial base, there's enough of a gap there where the government can s- run semantics through. Yeah, but what are they doing with it? They're not making tiddlywinks. Machine. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and specifically, <laughs> look, look, Adam. Nuclear warheads don't kill people. People kill people. <laughs> like, Indeed, um, actually, no, money's no. fungible, really. Like it's, it's complex. You know, like it's a really, you know, it's really not. <laughs> if you give someone money and they use it to create guns, and you know that, and that's why you're giving it to them, and then they get arrested with a bunch of guns, you go, well, well, we didn't know that we were like. <laughs> have guns as a result you know what i mean like it's a yeah. pretty direct line it's it's the yeah, yeah. Right. it's one of those things where it's the the evils of um weapons um manufacturing and uh and uh, buying and selling them as well yeah um, you there was say, a Jack? story in um uh in 2016 like when it started to become apparent that trump might actually win as opposed to sort of just being being the laughing stock of the country i remember barack obama like going on this sort of frantic legislative tour of like cuz this this huge like all these defense systems he'd um, set up and watched over, you know, drone strikes and stuff like that. He suddenly realized that it might end up in Trump's hands, and he's like, mm. "Oh no! All this, all this power that could be abused is about to end up in the hands of someone who might abuse it." And so the the nuclear warhead stuff, like us funding it, becomes particularly worrying when we know that you know it could well be Trump mm. with his finger on the button, a guy mm. who had to have explained to him five or six times by the 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 Secretary of Defense why, why you can't they can't just use nuclear weapons if we have them. Yeah. So, yeah, really bad. Yeah, it's almost as though, you know, electing someone to the highest office of the land um, requires the having of some sort of character and leadership skills, and maybe you shouldn't just elect a former reality TV host and current future criminal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> but the the people who the fact that he might end up in prison, it pains me to think that for probably half of the United States, he is basically the Nelson Mandela of America. Oh my God, Jesus <laughs> Christ! Yeah, I know. He's like half of us see him as Hitler, the other half see him as Nelson Mandela, and there's no midpoint between those two people. That that Venn diagram has mm. no overlap. Honestly, a I cult. Watch, I've, I've watched a, 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 I do watch a bit of like right wing stuff. Um. Because I am do interested you? in military, but I do, do you actually. Know? Oh, I do didn't know that. that. I couldn't tell. Uh, because yeah, I mean, I'm interested in military stuff, and uh, there is a bit of a, a Venn, the Venn diagram of right wing and military stuff. Uh, it's a circle. Definitely, <laughs> it's a circle, just a flat circle. And a lot of a lot of people interesting when they talk about Trump, you know, they'll be like, "Oh, you did this," but then they'll sort of cognitively they'll be like, "Oh, well, I'll try and work a way around." They'll do some mental gymnastics mm. as to why he's still a good president. They'll be like, "Well, you know, he wanted to do the right thing, but there were people around him mm. telling him, you know, it's all the people around him telling him the yeah. wrong stuff." Trump's like, "Hold me back, hold uh, me back. I definitely want to bring yeah. back manufacturing to Ohio if it were, you know, just like hold me back, fam. Like I'm gonna go nuts on him. Like, I mean, yeah. the, the real, I mean." The other thing that it's a possibility, not just with you know what he may or may not do with military arsenals, is that this whole orchestra deal, which we have already given money towards and we are mm. spending at the moment on, is he could very well turn around and rip this treaty up when he gets into office because uh, it doesn't yeah, necessarily align not- with a US-centric policy, right? Yeah, he's not very consistent on a lot of things, but one thing he is consistently against is any form of international cooperation yeah. or and those kinds of treaties with allies. He he has a habit of going like, well, sure, we agreed to this thing, but now that we've got what we wanted from the thing, why would we bother yeah. honouring our side of it? I just don't understand the question. He's and, yeah. um, an internationalist in all the ways, in all the worst ways, and a populist like in all the worst ways as well. It's like, uh, sorry, not an internationalist, an isolationist. What did I say? He's he's an isolationist in isolationist. In, like, in, in the worst ways where it's like, oh, we will, you know, pull out of, you know, uh, multilateral bodies and, you know, multilateral agreements and things like that, you know, the Iran nuclear deal and things like that, you know, all these important sort of agreements, he'll pull out of those. But then he'll be like, oh, Soleimani, like, yeah, I'll, I'll bomb that guy. Who cares if it starts like World War Three? Like, so he's an isolationist yeah, yeah. when it comes to multilateral agreements, bad. But when it comes to like 
bombing some guy and maybe starting a conflict. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I don't mind getting into an odd war every now and then. Like, that's fine. It's like mm. the worst parts of both worlds. He sucks. Yeah, yeah right. It's, and you were talking, Adam was talking about, you know, watching some sort of right wing media from time to time and stuff. I, I would like to say on the record that I actually have nothing against conservatives. I Actual conservatives. Like, conservatives. like I can, yeah, I can yeah. read Andrew well, Sullivan, hey. who's like a legitimate conservative guy who's not batshit and be like, oh, I can see why you think that Andrew Sullivan, person who is sane, but a conservative. Like I, I yeah, get yeah. that. Yeah, I was going to say, conservatives are fine. What I hate is liars. And yeah. like Bullshit Trump artists. is, so uh, Trump isn't even a, a conservative. Like conservatives care about some things. Progressives care about other things. Trump only cares about Trump. Yeah. So uh, like he ended up, there's a reason he was like a Democrat for a while or a Republican for a while. He would do whatever it he's, took. He's what to, they like, call a, a popularist <laughs> leader. He's <laughs> yeah, a popularist. Right, he does okay. his own thing. Um, mm. But he just so happens the Republican Party are the ones willing to throw money behind him. Um, yeah. The other thing I just want to touch on with this, uh, this nuclear stuff is that the other thing that's been revealed recently is that Australia will take nuclear waste uh, from the UK and US as part of this deal. Great. Uh, which was previously cool. said that it wasn't probably going to happen. Aussies love taking nuclear waste, famously so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always gonna... said this country should do more recycling, so I'm glad they're making <laughs> some moves on it. Um. And, yeah, uh, I guess the other thing that Michael West sort of hinted at was that there are members of the Labor Party. Um, so while Defence Minister and Prime Minister and other members of the Labor Party are very much like, oh, this is our official policy now and we love AUKUS, we love the US, we love Britain and yada, 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 there are lots of members from the Labor Party who, or well, not lots, but there are some at least, that are uh, bitter that they have been forced to take this from the former uh, coalition government and sort of run with it uh, mm. because it economically uh, there are a lot of things that don't stack up. Strategically, you could say, you know, are cool submarines cool as a deterrent? Yes. Uh, having them in 30 to 40 years, is that worth it? Probably, probably not. Um, but, yeah, there are a lot of people that, that take uh, you know, that, that are moving around government that may have similar opinions, as it were. Boys with their toys. That's all it Indeed. is, honestly. Um, and is so, nuclear waste a toy? I forget. Well, it depends oh, wait, on the how submarines you, you meant. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so speaking of the US, um, there have been uh, more strikes against uh, Houthi militia types in Yemen, so mm. um, further escalating the whole Iran-backed conflict. Yeah. So... That's I mean, people have been saying, like, oh, it's going to escalate into a wider regional conflict and, like, it's already a wider this is regional what's conflict. Happening. Yeah, so so for um, those who don't know, the Houthis yeah. were saying that um, they're, they're a former rebel group that now are basically in charge in Yemen. Um, and they were, well, you know, they well, tried parts to- Parts of the country. But parts yeah. of the country. And they were bombed to ship by the Saudis and then that didn't really work out. They kind of gave up on that a couple of years ago and now they're sort of, like, semi-in charge of the region. Well, certainly of the capital, at least. And so- yeah. um, They've been bombing um, ships passing through the Red Sea headed to the Suez Canal. Now, 12% of the world's trade goes through that canal. And they're saying, oh, well, we're doing this with our solidarity, in solidarity with our brothers in Gaza and, you know, who are obviously being bombed by Israel still. And, uh, and that's their justification now. The US is getting really pissed off because they're hitting US ships and US allied ships and things like that. And so some ships are going south and basically circumnavigating Africa, <laughs> going around the Cape of Good Hope yep. in order to deliver stuff way, around yeah. the long way in order mm. to get goods through. Um, but but essentially, yeah, I don't know how to read this as anything but a US escalation of the conflict that's it's, happening in yeah. Gaza. Like this is exactly what everyone it's, was afraid of, is that, like you said, spreading into a wider regional conflict. And the US is like, yeah. yep. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. what, what happened was that, I mean, they're not just getting hit by, you know, an RPG. They're getting hit by anti-ship yeah. cruise missiles, missiles fired from land, yeah. which, and, you know, Iran is ostensibly giving them those weapons. Oh, they, uh, they stopped a shipment just the other day, apparently, yeah. of, yeah, weapons that were coming from Iran to go to yeah. Yemen for this purpose, so. Um, 
in addition to this, there are other things that are happening in the region as well. So Iran has been shooting ballistic missiles into Iraq, targeting US and is allegedly Israeli spy bases. Uh, they've also shot something in Pakistan. <laughs> like the Iran fired a missile into Pakistan, which I think some it's people one of those things. The just, lights go out and everyone wants to like settle their grievances all at once as well. <laughs> They're like, yeah. yeah, it's definitely because of the Gaza thing, like um, for sure. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously the. You know, in in Israel itself, you've got the ground war, the air war uh, in Gaza, and then yeah, you've I got, think tw- we're um, up to twenty twenty six thousand civilian casualties. Yeah. I think I read like yeah, it, um, that's obviously and horrendous. And Hezbollah and uh, Israel exchanging artillery fire to the north still as well, as well as skirmishes in the West Bank. Um, so this is like we're not in a. Uh, you wouldn't say that there is a official war happening, but Iran and Iran proxies are basically. We're we're in a, right, a wider regional you, conflict now. You could where Iran easily is, see how yeah. this cascades into like this is how exactly how World War One got started. Like some guy gets assassinated, and then you've yeah. got this convoluted web of you know loyalties and you know all these yeah. different kind of you yeah. know alliances, and then all these other you know. Well, if you hit him, then I'm going to hit you, and then you know the whole sort of. You could you could see how this cascades into a, a much larger regional conflict. Based well, it's, on it's this tricky because because Iran are very good and they've been doing this now for the last 10, 20 years. They use re- they they are very good at using regional actors to act in their stead. So whether yeah, that be proxies. Mil- militias, proxies, uh, you know, whether it be the Houthis in in Yemen, whether it be militias in Iraq Hezbollah. or whatever else, Hamas, Hezbollah, well. um, yeah. Hamas. Yeah, um, I mean, pe- some people said that you know that Hamas committed their terror attack um, at the end of last year um, because of um, influence from Iran. They wouldn't have done that if Iran hadn't told them and given them the, the stuff to do mm. to do that. Um, the, the, the interesting escalation here is that, you know, the US, the, the Houthis have been attacking shipping, essentially, because they, they, they say the ships are going to Israel to supply Israel. Mm. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, but the interesting thing here is that, um, the US has put together a coalition of you know, several Western nations to put ships to basically screen tankers as they go through. But it's only recently that the US has started actively striking targets in Yemen. The French, for instance, don't want any part of this. They're happy to have ships sailing They've around the Gulf self, in the Red self-defense Sea. Self-defense setting is there. They, is they, they, will inter- they will intercept the missiles as they're coming in and, and stop them being used. But the US is actually the one, they're actually, you know, bombing, bombing Yemen now. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, isn't so, that yeah. different from when they were supporting the Saudis X number of years ago in doing that like that? We have, yeah. like, it was it was a, one of the, I'd say probably the largest scandal of the Obama administration, if I recall correctly, was the covert bombing of Yemen via drones, right? Like, then people go, why are yeah. we talking about X? We should be talking about the secret drone war. And this is what they were referring to. But now mm. it's all sort of just out in the open yeah. that... The US I mean, has decided to get engaged on another front. Like yeah. I don't, I don't know. Prior, prior to the um, the yeah the Hamas attacks um, in Israel, um, you know there were there were reports that the Saudis were thinking of you know trying to formalize some sort of normalization with the Houthis. I mean, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but there was there was some discussion of that. Um, so it's yeah, I mean it's. It's one of these things where, and and like the, the effect is real. Like this, the fact that there are not like there are fewer ships now transiting uh, the the Red Sea and and therefore the Suez Canal means that mum and dad uh, will now pay more for whatever it is at, at the shops. And, yeah, yeah. Um, like my partner's business, their ships are going around the Horn of Africa, and it is costing thirty percent more. So that's going to go to consumers at some point. Yeah, well, that, that's, um, I think, that- the thing that people are really upset about. Like when, um, when uh, what's his name? Uh, the US guy. Oh, fuck, what's Biden? Defense Secretary? No, yeah, the Defense Secretary. <laughs> fuck, what's his name? I'll find it in a sec. Uh, Jake remember. Sullivan, Secu- National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, um, said that um, basically... Uh, quote, uh, allies quote, must be, quote, vigilant against the possibility that, in fact, rather than heading towards de-escalation, we are on a path of escalation that we have to manage. Is basically like, yeah, you fucked with our money, so, like, we have to kill you now. Like, this is one thing you can't do is fuck with the US's money. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, Jack, you've been but, trying to get sorry. in. What, 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 what do you have to say? Oh, I, I, I was going to try to work out. So it sounds like you guys follow... Um, 
politics of the the region, like the geo geopolitics of the Middle East, closer than I do. I just wanted to make sure that I had all this straight. So, um, Iran hates Saudi Arabia, right? That's been going on for decades. And yeah, decades the and different decades. different sects yeah. of Islam, um, Sunni and Shia. Yeah, 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 right. So, um, so you've got the the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia and the Shias in Iran, mm. and the US um, became closely allied with the Saudis because they needed the oil, right? So this goes way back Many, as well. Way back, why, yeah. When a yeah. whole bunch of Saudis like did September 11, uh, America sort of invaded Iraq instead of Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia were their very, very good friends. Mm. And But because you've got um, uh, sort of... Saudi Arabia seeing itself as like, well, literally Mecca for the Sunnis, but sort of the the leader of all the Sunnis in the region, Iran being sort of the leader of all the Shias, and the US being so closely tied to the Saudis. Is that why Iran hates the United States and would therefore- I mean, that's not the only uh, reason why, but that's, that's, there's, there's, uh, there's other reasons. So um, I think it was Operation Ajax, it was called. Oh, this is when the CIA um, were like trying to sell them fake nuclear weapons, and then they managed to turn it into real nuclear so, weapons. So basically, like so it's um, yeah. If you Google Operation Ajax, it'll there's lots of information that comes up. But basically, the CIA in 1953 tried to do a, a coup d'état again. Well, did effectively, you know, a, a coup d'état against the uh, Mossadegh, who was the uh, a kind of a a leftist sort of like almost not quite socialist, but like sort of definitely left leaning type yeah, right, leader okay. mm. that de- then destabilized the region so much that allowed for the, you know, uh, the, the Islamic the, revolution, the Islamic revolution yeah, yeah, later yeah. on in the seventies. So yeah. Um, okay. And the I overthrow of the Shah. The... So like, it's a long yeah. complicated, like there's also like a bit of like sort of colonialist history yeah. in there as well. Like very, yeah. Iran yeah. is very <laughs> much. Iran's wanted to have nuclear weapons for however long, and the US sure. keeps stopping them and and sanctioning them. And but then they killed their general, as George said. Yeah, this is the other thing. Soleimani, <laughs> Soleimani was like as a national martyr now because of Trump doing that. Um, to the point where, and this like Iran's regional presence is is very active. They're very active in Syria. They're very active in Iraq. To the point where Iraq. Iraq is mostly Shia, but they have a Sunni sort of class like the Ba'ath Party, which ruled mm. obviously Iraq for so long. But anyway, yeah. they're gone now. So the the influence of Iran on Iraqi politics is such where now because the US are getting bombed in northern Iraq, that the I know it's presumably there are Iraqis in those bases as well that are probably getting, you know, hurt or attacked um the iraqi government is now thinking about ejecting all u.s forces from iraq which obviously the u.s doesn't want to happen Mm. um and the u.s also has bases in syria um so you know like the like iran's they've played it well their their influence in the region is um palpable and i mean you know if, if i was in their shoes like why would you like it's probably a fair play that they're they're playing power politics and they're doing it you know, covertly, they're doing it smartly, they're doing it cheaply, um, you know, yeah. whereas the US is spending however much money to put bases in different places that are that are vulnerable to missile attacks. Yeah, but it's also the kind of thing where if you, if you want to hurt your enemy without getting sort of blowback on yourself, I mean, in this instance, so uh, Iran backs Hamas, um, Hamas attacks um, Israel, um, for you know, under understandable reasons, having been in, occupied for for so very long, but then because Benjamin Netanyahu is so concerned with his own political survival and not at all concerned with Palestinian lives, he mm. basically you know levels Gaza, kills all these civilians and stuff. But that doesn't hurt Iran at all, right? So no, it so plays into, it plays into what Iran's. This is exactly hands. what Iran wants. Yeah, yeah basically, yeah. is to is, yeah. to, is yeah. to escalate the conflict and turn it into a larger mm. Muslim world against the United States type narrative, right? Fighting the the West, the, the West, yeah. Um, yeah. and like so far, it's working. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, to, yeah. to, to be fair to the United States, I don't know like what Jake Sullivan really could say other than like, yeah, if you like bomb our ships going through going through to the Suez Canal, we're going to bomb you back. Like, I don't know what they can do but to escalate. Um, yeah. But this is, this is why conflict is bad, is because conflict always gives rise to other conflict. Like, at each stage, we can go back yeah, and go- It's contagious. It's contagious. Like, this, you know, this is exactly why the invasion of Iraq 
in the early 2000s was a terrible fucking idea because you destabilize the region. You know, people get moved around, people get killed, resentments grow and linger. Like it's it's just it, mm. it's a never ending kind of like panoply of fucking awfulness, which is why we shouldn't like go on <laughs> engage in uh uninformed, unrequired wars of aggression in the Middle East in the first place. <laughs> Which is what we were saying yeah. at the time, but yeah. well, and that—that's what Macron was basically saying, right? He's like, "Hey, we're we're an echidna. Uh, like, the, Fr- the French are ones to talk. Echidna. Okay, let's look at large swathes of Africa. Okay, before we start yeah. taking the French at their at their at their word for not being colonialist. Why, yeah, sorry, why, why no, do they speak I, um, French in Algeria again? Remind me. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I was talking about what Macron said recently, not what what France has done over the, the yeah, decades, yeah, yeah. Uh, centuries. Yeah. Yeah. But no, Fr- France, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're sort of trying to protect shipping lanes without having to escalate the situations. But, they, you know, um, France could sit there and do a dance and it wouldn't matter because at the end of the day, this is really about the US and Israel, effectively. Um has Biden so, yeah. still not called for a lasting ceasefire? He's so everyone's everyone's back channeling. Everyone's yeah, trying to, they're, but they're publicly saying yeah. that they're back channeling, which I find really interesting as a tactic yeah. to be like, <laughs> "Don't worry, guys, like we're back channeling. We've got this." So it's like you know, if you tell everyone that you're back channeling, the back channeling doesn't like because they're trying to save face. They go, "No, no, no, we're telling them in private." Like, don't. And it's like, okay, but if you tell all us that, like, if you can say it to us in public that you're back channeling, why not just? make the call in public. I, th- I think they've got a lot of, I-, I think people really overestimate the amount of influence that the U S administration actually has in Israel. Like you go with it, you know, they're funding it. They're sending all this money and all these weapons. They could cut that off. And yes, they could, but like, that doesn't mean that between Bibi Netanyahu and Joe Biden, like Joe Biden could just say, stop the war tomorrow. And he's going no. to like, I don't think that's the, the case. The, like Netanyahu is out on, out on yeah. Olympia. He's, he's doing whatever he wants. Right. Yeah, and not just he's, Netanyahu, he's pretty the... unpopular now. Right. Like he was already sure. lost the, the, uh, oh, and there were criminal the cases left. that are sort of pending against him. And like, there's a whole kind of like his incentive is to stay in power as long as possible to try and like outrun mm. those legal cases as well as, you know, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of dissatisfaction about him wanting to change the constitution and, and sort of arrange the way the ju- judicial system has oversight, basically making it like a, a one party state that the government can do whatever it wants. And there's no check on that power from the, from the courts. Mm. So it's like, yeah, yeah people right. hated him already. And then this happened and they're like, uh, Netanyahu. Yeah. So, so it's like as long as he's in the seat, he's alive, and that's his yeah. focus is keeping the seat at the moment. The the, pro- the problem is though is that it's not just his party. So Netanyahu is the leader of a coalition in Israel, and the coalition is made up a num of a number of far right parties. So sure. Netanyahu. Well, is- they've got a unity government Net- allegedly, but yeah, I think that's sort of breaking down. Well, yeah, I mean it, it's one of those things where it's like. Yeah, people might not like Netanyahu, but the fact is most of the people who have positions of power now in um, Israel are far right right wingers. And when we say, like to George's point, that they're not being Israel isn't being told what to do, they're probably not. A lot of these guys have, you know, they're very ideological anti- perspectives. Yeah, ideological perspectives yeah. Of, of of you know Israel being one state and fuck the Palestinians. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. Netanyahu spent like his whole career trying to resist a, a sort of two-state solution, hasn't he? Like, um, he, basically, he I mean, de- depending on who you ask, yeah, he, he. It sounds like he's basically he'll he'll talk out of two sides of his mouth. To the west, he'll turn around and say, in English, he'll say, "Hey, I'm you know your best bet for getting a two-state solution. I'm the one who knows all the players. Like, leave me in charge. Like, you deal with me. I'm I'm the sort of rational actor guy." And then to the far right parties at home, in Hebrew, he'll say. You got to trust me. I'm the only guy who can deal with the Americans. Like, if we're going to, you know, like, so, so he's yeah. constantly kind yeah, of like right, okay. occupying this wheeling and dealing middle space. But yeah, I, I th- yeah. it seems as though the intention is to avoid a two state solution because. Yeah. But when you, <laughs> when you talk it's- about there being so many, so many ideologues in his mm. party or his coalition yep. of parties, is this yeah. why they're, they're like publicly saying, you know, yes, 25,000 people are being killed in, in Gaza, but. We have killed nine thousand militants. Like that's their claim, and they think 
that makes them look good because you're like, well, th- does that mean you killed yeah. 16,000 civilians? And they're there's, like, oh, well, yeah. There's also, but- a, like, there's also a, an entrenched, and I was talking about this when it first happened, that in Israel, the, the, the way the Israeli military operates, and I guess the civilian population have sort of just gotten used to it, mm. is that, and this has been happening for 30, 40 years, there is a, an attack from Gaza or, you know, a Palestinian thing, yeah. and then Israel drops a bomb. That's their solution. Uh, you you come at us, we'll come at you hammer. twice as hard, They're right? They're fucking hammer, yeah. and every single problem is a nail. Yeah. Um, there is no, and then, you know, then they'll, do, like they did this in 20, whatever it was, 2007, I want to say, 2006. Uh, there was a, a thing, 2014, there was a similar situation. Yeah. Although and, not and, as which, bad. like, to, to be fair to Israel, yeah. like, you can't just put up with, suicide bombers and people bombing your country no, and just like do nothing I, about it. Like I, I I'm yeah. sympathetic to the idea that you, you, <laughs> you have, you, you are surrounded by enemies. Dropping bombs on them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you're surrounded by enemies who want to kill you and literally say things like push you into the sea. Right. Like, so I'm sympathetic yeah. to the idea of defending yourself, but I think where everyone agree, more or less everyone agrees is that Israel's campaign over the last, whatever it is, four months now uh, has been, reckless to 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 put the most charitable interpretation of it has been reckless to civilians who are being killed in their tens of yeah. thousands at this point so it's, it's, you, you yeah, can't it's, like i'm all for getting rid of hamas and polar knights who's commenting in the chat saying um you know israel can't leave hamas in power like i agree bad guys don't want to go yeah. to a hamas house party um there's, there's like obviously they this. can't be in charge anymore after what's happened they need to get yeah. rid of them but the scale of the human misery and that's been created as a result of Israel's careless bombing campaign. <laughs> let's put, so let's yeah. put the most charitable spin on it possible and say careless um, has resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of people. Like whether or not it's a genocide, like there's uh, South Africa made a claim about that recently to the International Criminal Whatever Court of Justice. Yeah, I, I like that's for you know lawyers to work out. It is most certainly what they're doing is war crimes. It is like we yeah. can absolutely d- describe it as indiscriminate, yeah. right? Just like the terrorist attacks from Hamas were indiscriminate and war crimes, what Israel is now doing to the populace in Gaza is the same, right? So Yeah. But that, what my point being is that tactically speaking, they've been doing the same thing for 30 years and nothing has changed. But, and I feel like they've sort of convinced themselves that this is the best way to, like, to do it. But like if you want to de-radicalize people, it's not, dropping bombs not the way to do it. So, yeah. so, but, but like for some reason they've got in their heads that this is the only way forward. It's like they've but got- But if you look at the tunnel, figures tunnel that they've got, like the, their current minister of national security is Itmar Ben Gavir, who like is a famous, like, I, I don't even like far right. I doesn't quite begin to describe this guy. Like he, you know, there was a story, an anecdote about him having a picture in his office of um, like a, a mass murderer you know, and like, you know, sort of revering this guy for for killing Palestinians, right? Like these aren't, it's not like, oh, there's the left of politics who want, you know, higher taxes and the right of mm. politics who wants lower taxes. They're like literally making statements talking about how we, you know, how they need to wipe Palestine off the face of the earth sort of thing. Yeah. So it's like, it's not, it's not a, mm. it's not good. And this no. is exactly who yeah. Netanyahu's in bed with, right? So yeah. he's the least objectionable part of his... <laughs> coalition if you can believe that right so yeah right you've got kind of one one con man surrounded by ben robert smith types sort of i couldn't I mean, possibly yeah. comment on ben robert smith <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, who who among us could um I mean, russia's got a similar problem as well where you know putin is you know it, it's putin's putin but like he is surrounded by yes men and people that want to go harder on some of his policies than Putin himself does. Like, I think it's absolutely it's, it's, possible that we look at know. the October 7th terrorist attack as the ignition point for a much wider conflict over the next couple of years, which is really scary. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. fun times. Lego. <laughs> Lego. <laughs> as a, Do you want to write Santos or, or no, Lego? Fuck it, Lego? No, I haven't got time for Santos. So um, Lego worth thousands of dollars has been seized as police arrest, uh, arrest an alleged Melbourne drug trafficker. So we're doing our very best to finish light. Um, yes, is talking- Lego in fact a drug? Because my, my nine-year-old son is really into it and I'm getting a bit concerned. No, you know what it is. It's meth heads. Meth heads like to take things apart and disassemble and reassemble yeah. things. Like, I legitimately think that's what it is. Like this guy has a penchant for 
getting high on his own supply yeah. and just and making I'm a just fucking death star. A guy like, who's like replaced all his teeth with white Lego bricks. <laughs> he, maybe he might have. Yeah. I mean, who knows? So there was a seizure on uh, Thursday. Uh, it inc- also included $2 million worth of chemicals that can be used to make methamphetamines. Uh, and they took uh, um, 74 toy sets uh, from the drug traffickers' house uh, because these are allegedly proceeds of crime. Um, believe it or not, this is not the first time they've had to steal, uh, not steal, um, seize uh, large amounts of Lego. Uh, in November, uh, someone, a uh, similar sort of thing, uh, there were 1,130 boxes uh, worth more than $200,000 that were confiscated uh, from an illegal meth lab as well. So for some reason... So, I mean, lightning strikes twice. Methods it must like be the puzzles. Methods I'm telling you. They like puzzles and Lego. Yeah. They got sick of all their VCRs being pulled apart and put back together again and said, let's do something constructive. Let's build a Millennium Falcon. Like, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, again, I, I have some experience with Lego because of my nine year old. That guy didn't have a Millennium Falcon. Like, you, you just said, Adam, that there were like a thousand boxes. Total value is like twenty thousand dollars. Those twenty dollar boxes of Lego, you're not getting very much in those. There's um... uh, uh, well, Jack. How how you are wrong, my how, friend. The police <laughs> uncovered and seized a large Lego collection, which is suspected of being the proceeds of crime, including the Star Wars Millennium Falcon model, which retails oh, for twelve ninety nine, and the now retired police station model, which I think is personally hilarious to have a police station Lego. <laughs> <laughs> when you are a career criminal, I think that's just brilliant. I love, I, I love it. Oh, that's great. Mm. I'd, I'd love to see the guy like playing with his Legos, going like, hur, hur, "I'm going to arrest you." You'll never you. catch me, like, be a Baron. <laughs> well, what, what, what's interesting is that none of the, oh well, in, in terms of uh, what we can see here from the pictures and from the article, none of these are constructed. They're all just Lego sitting in the box. Oh, <laughs> which is weird. Oh, oh, whoa! Is it? Could it be like money laundering? Rather than like I mean, a Lego addiction, potentially. I mean, it's it's proceeds of crime, so they've used the money from the criminal activities. Oh, the criminal to Legos a, oh. to, to buy the Legos. And I guess the question is, well, do you hold the Lego? I mean, you know, people who listen to this podcast might know more than me. You know, if you if you collect Lego and don't construct it, is it therefore worth more? Well, over if it's time? a discontinued it like, it like model, yeah, maybe trading cards or something like, yeah, yeah. I I was going to say, I mean, if you they release sort of new sets every year meaning that there's sort of run out model type lego meaning that if your kid really wants such and such a set that they saw last year you probably can't get it anymore except on ebay so actually as a money laundering scheme this is me committing crimes in my head again this is actually a really really good method because lego it doesn't weigh very much it's easy to store it's the kind of thing where yeah you can you can definitely easily sell it on eBay, but you could also, like people buying it on Gumtree would pay cash. So it's like a cash business mostly. And in addition to that, it's the kind of thing where you could tell the tax office, oh, I sold this rare piece of Lego for $200. And that other person could give you $200 for the Lego, so they don't want the Lego. Jack, I think you might be galaxy braining this. I think it, I think the guy just likes Lego. Like, I think it really is as straightforward <laughs> as that. I reckon, no, I reckon Jack's broken it down. He's, he's cracked this case am wide I, am open. Am I going to see this in your next novel, Kill Your Meth Heads? Am I gonna, is this going to turn <laughs> up as a plot point? Kill your Lego dealers. Yeah. Maybe I should release my own Kill Your Husband's Lego set that comes with, like, six figurines. I don't hate it. Possible. <laughs> one of them's buff the gym yeah. owner's kind of like a buff lego yeah i could see it oh yeah yeah but with pirate just lego. Sort of the abs drawn on yeah, yeah, yeah. same same oh, no, they shape need to be as a regular lego for the, person for the factory um well they also needed to be uniform for the book because they needed to be interchangeable in the dark so sexy on that note uh, yeah sorry <laughs> I, I you tried to end on a light fun note i made it a dark sexy note i'm really sorry <laughs> the dark sexy note the jack heath experience on that note we have been we are and we always will be our natural selection make sure you visit us at our salubrious home on the web unnaturalshow.com make sure for make sure you follow us on all the bullshit social, social medias that have do or ever will exist at unnatural show that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and mother flipping TikTok. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram at George Tsipos. Uh, you can follow me down to the local Lego store where I'll be liquidating my bank account and 
buying up Lego uh, for a future investment because uh, that's probably getting a better rate of return than uh, my shares at the moment. So, so it's better than NFTs. Um, Jack, yeah. once more, where can people find you and uh, your uh, Kill Your Husband's book? Oh, yeah. So uh, the, the book is in all good bookstores and on Audible. Um, I Like I said, I'm off social media for a year, but hey, my newsletter has like lots of cool free stuff in it and stuff, mm. and you can get that uh, at jackheathwriter.com. Lovely. Delightful. Thank you so much for joining us, Jack. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Bye.